Hi everyone, my name is Colin Fulton. They is my preferred pronoun. Uh, I work for a company called Duo Security, which is a division of Cisco. We're a cloud security company. Really awesome place to work. If you're looking for work, feel free to talk to me afterwards. Uh, I put my Twitter handle, GitHub, and email up there. Honestly, I don't really use Twitter that much, so if you want to get in touch with me, email is generally the better way, but you know, if you absolutely have to tweet about things, you can go ahead and use that Twitter handler. All right. So who is this talk for? It's really difficult to put together a talk on a rather esoteric subject like this because the audience is generally pretty split between people who have absolutely no idea how any of this stuff works and people who know way more about it than me. So I've tried to add some content for people who may not have gotten a degree in computer science. For example, I actually got a degree in art and design and theater and who want to learn a bit more about how computers work under the hood and how vintage computers used to work. But I also tried to add some more historical context as well as some more advanced information about implementation details for people uh, who are looking at the more technical side of this and who may actually know a little bit about how these old computers work. Uh, so, while preparing this talk, I noticed that on the Strange Loop homepage it said, meet us in St. Louis to make connections with the creators and users of languages, libraries, tools, and techniques at the forefront of the industry. I find this hilarious because the computer that's hooked up to the projector right now for the rest of this presentation is going to be used just for uh, my presentation notes. The rest of my slides are on this five and a quarter inch floppy disk on which I have encoded all my slides and a 200 byte assembly program which acts as slide presentation software. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go ahead and pop that disk in the drive, switch over the HDMI cable. Make sure this is up and running and I'm going to, once this boots up again, there we go. There we go. The lovely sound of floppy disk loading. <laughs> now, uh, if I run the catalog command here, oops, and spell correctly, uh, it's going to print out all the different files on this. The hello file there is just a basic initialization script that kind of holds the actual operating system to load off disk, and then there is a file called slides. So if I run the binary run command, brun, on the file slides, it's going to load that off disk. I, I promise it's loading. There we go. <laughs> All right, so here we go. So what is this talk going to be about? It's going to be about languages that were behind the cutting edge, specifically languages that were not even at the forefront in the 1980s. Uh, at the time of the Apple II, almost all the languages that I'm going to show you, except of course for Ruby, were really just kind of common everyday place languages. They were nowhere near all the fancy stuff they did back then. Um, all the tools that I'm going to show you are completely useless. You will never use them at your job. If you will use them at your job, I want to talk to you because you clearly do something very interesting for a living. <laughs> um, but what is this talk really about? It's about my quest to do something that I would consider very hard and very useless. My two favorite things to do in computer programming. Run Ruby on the Apple II. Run a completely modern programming language on an absolutely outdated piece of hardware. Um, it, this talk is also about reminding ourselves about how far we've come as computer programmers. Even in the past 10 years, our jobs have rather dramatically changed and things have gotten dramatically better. So it's important to remind ourselves kind of what programming used to be like back in the day. And also this talk is about having fun with computers. Maybe everything that we do doesn't have to be practical. We can occasionally just do projects for fun. Uh, so how many of you here have actually used an Apple II before? Awesome. So that's a huge percentage of the audience. Uh, I actually am younger than almost all models of Apple II that ever came out. This computer is actually made before I was born. However, my grandparents had an Apple IIc, like the Apple IIc that's up here on stage. Um, uh, and I remember playing Tetris on that Apple IIc. And I clearly remember that uh, because, well, a modern keyboard has the arrow keys laid out like this in sort of the normal T organization. The Apple IIc lays them out like this. So you got left and right and then down and then up. And as a young child, I could not figure out how to play Tetris with this weird layout. 
the original Apple II from 1977 had an arrow key layout like this. Didn't actually have up and down keys because why would you need those? I mean, you can go forward and back in your text and that's all you'd ever need. Worse than that, the original Apple II didn't actually have a delete key on the keyboard. You could just hit the back key and rewrite over whatever you did. Later models of the Apple II, like the Apple II C here, did add a delete key. However, because the original software that's kept inside the Apple II through all the decades that it was produced um, need to be on there for backwards compatibility, when you hit that delete key, it doesn't actually delete anything. It instead just types random characters on the screen. It was only more modern programmers that would actually incorporate the delete key in their programs. Uh, so as I said, this is an Apple IIc, one of the later models that came out. It's the compact version. Um, the Apple II has a uh, one megahertz clock in it, and that was kind of carried through all of the Apple IIs, except for some much later ones that kind of gave up on backwards compatibility. And the originals had as little as eight kilobytes of RAM. To give you an idea of how small that is, that was all of the RAM on the machine. It shared video RAM with your program and with all your execution data. That meant that with eight kilobytes of RAM, you could barely do anything, which is why most people upgraded. And this, this model here actually is a fair amount more RAM than that. And Apple ended up selling over the course of the Apple II's history and all the different variants about five to six million of these. By some metrics, the Apple II is basically the most successful line of computers ever made, being produced from 1977 all the way to the mid-90s in all of its various incarnations. Uh, so, since some of you here I know um, may not be, you know, may not know as much about how computers work under the hood, I just want to give you a brief glossary of terms uh, that I'm going to be using throughout this talk. A register is a little bit of memory inside the CPU, and you can think of that like a variable. Inside the CPU, it's a little space that you can store temporary values and manipulate things. So whenever I say register, think of that like a hardware equivalent of a variable in your program. Um, you also have instructions and opcodes. Instructions are like the functions that a CPU can do. So all of the instructions that a CPU has defines all of the things it can do, like addition, multiplication, moving data around. Uh, opcodes are the actual numerical representations of all of those, because all that a computer does at the end of the day is process numbers. So every little instruction is represented by some number. If you string together all the numbers to represent your entire program, you have what's known as machine code. It is the raw binary that runs even today to run all of your programs. Uh, if you translate that raw binary, all the various hexadecimal values, into something a human can read and do a one-to-one -one translation of it, you have what's known as assembly language. Assembly language is kind of the definition of a low-level programming language. You can directly look at assembly and exactly figure out what machine code instructions are going to be created. That isn't true for a language like C. In a language like C, even though we think of that as a very low-level language, if you write a switch statement, the compiler could uh, end up implementing that switch statement with one of maybe 12 different algorithms. They all have various different uh, bits of assembly in order to run them. Alrighty. So, the computer that defines our current time is the x86-64 processor. And to understand the CPU inside of the Apple II, it's important to understand what uh, our modern day computers can do with x86-64 processors. That's basically all the CPUs that you buy from Intel and AMD today. All the ones that are in our laptops and desktop computers. Uh, it is what's known as an out of order superscalar computer, which is really fun to say, and those are some fancy words. What they mean, out of order there, means that even though your program consists of a sequence of instructions, at runtime the CPU reorders all of those instructions. So for example, if you do a bunch of addition operations and then load from memory, the CPU may look at that and say, well, loading from memory takes a long time. So why don't I just do that first and then do all the addition operations you want to do first? Super scalar means that more than one instruction can run at the same time. And at runtime, the CPU is figuring out how many instructions it can do at once. There are little circuits inside the CPU that will form things like addition, multiplication, and all that jazz. The CPU knows how many it has available, and it looks at your program at runtime and figures out how many of those instructions it can actually execute all at once. So if you're doing an addition, a multiplication, and a division, those are all separate circuits in your computer, at least in the case of some computers. And so if there's no data dependencies between them, an out-of-order superscalar CPU may decide that it can run all of those instructions at once at runtime, even though you told it to do them sequentially. This is really confusing. 
I'm amazed that it actually works, but the reason why modern CPUs are getting faster and faster and faster isn't because the clock speeds are getting faster, as you may have noticed. It's because of tricks like this, where the CPU at runtime is taking existing programs and trying to optimize them as it's reading through the machine code. Uh, x86-64, the 64 there means that it's 64-bit. And there are two meanings of 64-bit here. One is that the 16, which is a lot, general purpose registers um, inside the CPU can each store a 64-bit value. So every single variable that you have inside the CPU, every single register can store up to 64 bits, which is a heck of a lot. And general purpose here as far as registers mean that you can perform almost any of the instructions available to you on those registers. There are some that are a little bit more specialized, but basically all 16 of those 64-bit registers can do almost anything in a modern CPU. Uh, 64-bit here also means that there's a 64-bit address space. So that means each address that looks into memory can be up to 64 bits long. That allows you to address exabytes of memory. Exabytes are ridiculously large. I would be willing to bet that within our lifetime, none of us will ever need an exabyte of memory, unless you are doing the very, very top end of supercomputer work, maybe in the distant future, your home CPU is never going to have an exabyte of memory. So this 64 address space is going to last us for a very, very long time. Mind you, those are famous last words whenever someone has said computers are powerful enough now, but I'm going to stand by. x86-64 is over a thousand instructions, depending on how you count it. Over a thousand things that the CPU can do. And that number is growing as things like cryptography requirements as well as uh, graphic requirements, meaning they keep adding more and more specialized instructions. Instead of having to write out multiple instructions to do a command, you can use a very specialized one to do exactly what you want. Now these instructions look like things like inc, increment, which just takes a value in a register and adds one to it, a relatively common operation, which is why it has its own instruction. Mul, the multiply command, take maybe a value from memory and a value in a register, multiply them together, store them in a, another register. And then other commands, like this one, this sub add, okay, so this is a fuse multi, sorry, fuse multiply alternating subtract slash add of packed double precision floating points. The majority of those 1,000 commands in x86 are weird super specialized things like this. Now, you may not have to do this very often, but your compiler may see like, oh man, instead of like doing a bunch of instructions here, I could just do one fuse multiply alternating at subtract slash add of pack double precision floating point values, and then hey, there's one instruction that does that. I actually have no idea what that instruction does, and so we're gonna move on. <laughs> All right, what's inside the Apple II is the 6502 processor. This is an amazing processor. Arguably, it is the processor that defined the home computing era because this is the processor that really got the home computing revolution going. You'll find it in the Apple II, you'll find it in the Commodore 64, you will also find it in game systems like the, uh, the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System. The 6502 is a very simple microprocessor. It takes an instruction, and then it interprets it, and then it executes it. No out of order stuff, no parallelism, nothing like that. It simply takes your code and executes it exactly as you have written it. It is an 8-bit CPU, but it has a 16-bit address space. That means every variable that you can deal with is only 8 bits long. The 16-bit address space causes problems because to address memory, you can't actually store an entire memory address in one register, and it doesn't let you fuse two registers together to get 16-bit values. Instead, you have to say, like, look at this page in memory, and then offset by this register value. Or you can load, like, a literal 16-bit, so if you know exactly where that byte is going to be in memory ahead of time, you can hard code that. But other than that, you kind of have to jump through hoops just to even get at things in memory because of the fact that it's a 16-bit address space, but each register is only 8 bits. And what about those registers? You have zero general purpose registers. <laughs> um, some people say that there's one, but I would say that that one register isn't a general purpose register because you can't actually do everything on it. Uh, it is, you have one 8-bit accumulator, so you can do things like addition on it. You can't actually do subtraction, you can't do multiplication, those are, you know, too fancy. Uh, but you can do addition on it, and you also can't do increment or decrement. It's relatively limited in what it can do, but it's designed to give you kind of all the basic mathematical operations that you would need. You then have two 8-bit index registers. 
And while those can't be used for fancy things like addition, you can do increment and decrement on them, and those are the registers that you can use to kind of do offsets and look up into memory. And so you have three non-general purpose registers that you kind of have to juggle with. And I don't know if you've ever tried to write a program only using three mutable variables. It's kind of hard and it's a little bit of a juggling act and you get run into a lot of bugs where, you know, things don't work because uh, you accidentally reused a register. It has 56 instructions, sort of. The reason why I say sort of is because, well, you didn't have any multiply, divide, or subtract operations of those 56. Uh, originally, you didn't have a rotate right instruction. Uh, and so they originally quoted as having 55 instructions. That's because there was an actual bug on the chip that they originally manufactured that caused rotate right to just fail horribly. And so they said, cool, it has 55 instructions. <laughs> And then a little bit later, they're like, and now we have a new version with 56 instructions. <laughs> wow. Uh, however, what made the 6502 really amazing was it was fast. It couldn't do very much, but what it did, it did very, very quickly. And it was cheap. At the time that it came out, it was one-sixth the price of all other microprocessors on the market. And they kind of forced every other manufacturer out there to really drive all their prices down, thus kind of causing the home computer revolution. 6502 was also a hobbyist dream. It was cheap, it was fun to program with because you had to do all these weird tricks just to get it to do anything useful. And one of those hobbyists who played around with 6502 early on was a guy named Steve Wozniak who ended up founding Apple. Um, Steve Wozniak was a master of really simple engineering solutions. At the start of this talk when I turned this computer on you may have heard a banging sound of the floppy disk. That is because this floppy disk drive does not actually have a position sensor. The computer doesn't actually have a sensor to say which actual track on the floppy disk it's reading. So this was to save money because that would have cost money. So instead, the floppy disk drive at startup rams itself against one of the sidewalls and keeps ramming itself until it's absolutely sure it's at the start. And then it's your responsibility as a programmer every time you move the read head to keep track of where it actually is. Um, this makes it harder on the programmer, but it does mean that they could save costs in manufacturing. Uh, now, Woz uh, couldn't actually afford an in-circuit emulator or an assembler or any of those fancy things that you might use to do development work. And so he wrote his own uh, monitor program in raw machine code. He wrote a program that would let him directly input uh, values into memory and see what was in memory and disassemble it wrote all that by hand, and then used that to implement the first version of BASIC. And so I would like to show you what it is like to program using something like a machine monitor. So I'm going to go ahead and exit out of my slides and go into the, uh, go in the mini monitor here. We have a little bit of a prompt. And I can say, for example, 654. And what it printed out there is that at address 654 in memory, you have the byte A1. We can also set bytes in memory. And so what you do is you would write down your program using um, pen and paper if you're feeling adventurous or a pencil and paper if you're someone like me. Um, write down the algorithm you want to do, figure out what are all the instructions that would be required to do that. Then you use a lookup table, translate that into machine code, and then type it into the machine, which looked a little bit something like this. So at address 800, I'm going to type in a colon, which means that I'm going to go ahead and edit the actual memory starting address 800. So first I want to load a literal value of 16 into the Y register. So the load to Y with literal is the A0 command. And then I'm going to, let me just uh, add a space here, A0. And then a 10 is the literal hexadecimal value of the number 16. So then I want to load the A register with something out of memory, and so I'm going to type in B9, 0, B, 0, 8. And if any of you catch any typos, please let me know. <laughs> I then need to store it, which is 990005. I'm storing it at address 500, but it's 0005 because it's little endian for those of you who are interested. Um, alrighty, and then I'm going to go ahead and do a decrement operation, which is 88. And then I'm going to do a branch if that decrement happened to hit zero, which is D0, and I'm going to branch back to F7, uh, then a break instruction. Isn't this exciting? This is what programming was like for Steve Wozniak back in the 1970s. 
It gets even more exciting because as any Lisper will tell you, programs are just data and your data and your program exist in the same place and there's no better way to learn that with assembly. So now I'm going to hand type in a little bit, bit of data. And those of you who happen to know the Apple II character set, don't, don't spoil anyone what I'm typing in. Uh, all right, so I typed in that double zero. So I'm going to do 48, 49, and then uh, 60. This is where it starts getting really fun. Uh, 53, 54. 4, 52, 41, 4E, 47. I know you guys are just absolutely thrilled at this, and you can imagine how nervous I am doing live machine code up here on stage. 4C, 4F. I always forget the second 4F, but this time I remembered it. 50, and then 61. I hit enter, and it wrote all that into memory. Isn't that exciting? Now, thank you. Now, uh, back in the day, this is what uh, people would do, and in universities, this is generally what graduate students would do. Someone would hand them, here's all the machine code, and they would hand type all this stuff in. Uh, one of von Neumann's graduate students was a man by the name of, I think his last name is pronounced, uh, Donald Giles. Um, he, in his free time, wrote a little program that actually would let him just type in, you know, a human readable version, assembly code, and it would translate that into us. When von Neumann found out that he had done this, he scolded him because computers should not be used for clerical work. You need to learn how to hand type all this stuff in because that really teaches you to feel what the computer is doing. I'm really glad that history proved von Neumann wrong. <laughs> so there's been enough suspense. I bet you're wondering what this program does. I'm wondering what it does because it depends <laughs> on if I typed it in correctly. So I'm going to say 800, so that's where the program starts, and then a G, which says execute starting at that line of memory. I hit enter, and you see it prints out strange loop to this, or, uh, whoa. It should. Okay. Upper left corner, you see it says strange loop exclamation point. Awesome. Obviously, I did something wrong here. <laughs> So the screen has gotten a little bit confused. No worries. Just going to go ahead and clear that out quickly. <laughs> awesome. I'm not going to fix that program for you live. However, if we hit 800L, it'll disassemble the program. And you can go ahead and look at here. And actually, it may be a relatively simple fix, but we are going to skip past that uh, because I don't want to waste all your time. But it printed strange loop to the screen, so there you go. Semi-working code. Uh, now you know what programming really was like. Alrighty. So, what was it that, let me go back to my slides one moment. Uh, Alrighty. Uh, I'm uh, going to go ahead, sorry, uh, next I'm going to go into basic, so I'm going to hit command B and enter. The programming language that um, Steve Wozniak entirely implemented this way was a version of basic. It's a relatively limited version of basic, and so later they replaced it with a really fancy one from a small company you may have heard of called Microsoft, and this is what became known as AppleSoft Basic. Uh, and AppleSoft Basic is kind of, and Basic in general, was sort of a language that was like a lingua franca. It was like the Python of its day. Uh, and most people who learn programming learn to program using Basic. Um, and in some ways it resembles programming languages like we have today. So if I say x equals 10 and then print x, it prints out the number 10. Nice. You also have strings in Basic. Ooh, fancy. So if I type in pugs equals cute and hit enter, it gives me a type mismatch error. And the reason for that is the variables that you do for strings are actually stored in a separate space as the variables that you do for integers. And the way you have to write this out is pugs and then a dollar sign and then equals cute. Now it works and I can say print pugs dollar sign and it prints out cute. Awesome. Let me define another variable for fun here. I'm going to say puppers dollar sign equals also cute. Cool. And I can print out puppers dollar sign. And it says also cute. Awesome. So we can like define multiple variables. Except there is a bug in this program. I know it doesn't seem like there's a bug here, but there is a bug. If I do print 
hugs, dollar sign. It prints out also cute. AppleSoft Basic was great in that you have variable names of any length, except it only looked at the first two characters of the variable. And so because pugs and puppers both start with the letters P and U, it stores them in the same place in memory. And I assume this made programming really fun. <laughs> All righty. Uh, now, to go back to my slides, I'm going to type in call 1016. There's a chance because of that bug that happened before, this may not work. Hey, it went back to my slides. For the record, there is not a, like, multi, uh, a multi-process operating system running here. I just am trying to write all this code so that they happen to not overwrite the same locations in memory. Um, <laughs> really fun to try and get that one working. Uh, all right. So, going back to the slides. Um, all right, so I don't know about you, but I think Ruby would be a much more fun programming language to have on the Apple II. I mean, Ruby is a much easier to learn programming language, and even if you don't like Ruby, surely you must think it's going to be easier than the weird stuff that you have to put up with uh, in something like BASIC. Uh, so, how are we going to do this? Well, you may think, well, there's a C Ruby implementation. That's the main one, C Ruby. So let's just compile that C code and run it on the Apple II. Everything will be great. It will not, because C Ruby expects certain things. It expects things like Unicode. And obviously, the Apple II came out before Unicode even existed, and thus it doesn't support Unicode characters. And that's kind of built into C Ruby core. It'd be really hard to tear that out. Uh, CRuby also expects ASCII. <laughs> Apple II doesn't use ASCII. It actually uses a weird uh, subset of ASCII where they took a small sample of it and then repeated it four times. One is the actual characters. One is an inverted version of all those characters. One is a flashing version of those characters. So you can do things like flashing cursors. Um, and then there was another one that's repeated. I don't actually know what that one was intended for, but it prints out exactly the same, just regular characters. Um, also, Fun fact, in the original Apple IIs, you didn't have like curly brackets, which means we can't even get regular Ruby syntax working because we're not going to have curly brackets. Um, CRuby's binary is also three megabytes in size. We have a 16-bit address space. We can't even address that much memory. Technically, we could like create a special language card with a, like a Raspberry Pi on it that sort of switched out memory and did all the fancy stuff for us, but then that wouldn't really be running Ruby on here. Now, some of you may know that there's an alternative version of Ruby called mRuby. mRuby is an embeddable version of Ruby. It's designed to work on uh, microprocessors and very small uh, CPUs. If you haven't played with it before, it's really fun. It's kind of like you can do like Arduino-style programming except in Ruby. Uh, so mRuby was made to fit on small CPUs like this. So surely it's a good choice. Uh, it's still too big uh, because it turns out even like the little microprocessors that get used in thermostats and things like that these days often have more RAM than uh, the Apple II does. And C is also too high level a language. Um, one of the reasons why they're so big is because the 6502 wasn't really a good language for C to target. There are a bunch of things that C expects to be relatively simple to do, where you have to do all kinds of weird memory lookups to make it happen on the uh, 6502 processor. So instead, writing in assembly is a much better choice because we can directly control exactly what the processor is doing and optimize it down to the smallest thing possible. Um, so, is all hope lost? Are we not going to be able to actually squeeze Ruby onto the Apple IIc? Uh, no, which is why I've been working on creating nRuby for the Apple II, um, a, completely useless or a completely useless variant of a very useful programming language. Uh, it's all the joy of Ruby, but packed into a really, really, really small space. Uh, my target is to get it so that it can actually work with only eight kilobytes of RAM to hold your program, all of your program data, and the actual interpreter itself. Uh, as I said before, it's written entirely in assembly, which is the only way to really make this work and is actually relatively normal for programming on these old machines. Um, May was asked what the N in nRuby stands for. It kind of stands for nano, but the main reason why it's called nRuby is because an N is half of an M. So if nRuby is a smaller version of mRuby, we're going to call it nRuby, which that makes sense when you write it down, but when you say it out loud, it just sounds like you're saying the same word over and over again. Uh, so uh, what does nRuby need? It needs uh, Ruby's flexible syntax, because you're not really a Ruby programming language unless you can do all sorts of, uh, do the same thing in all sorts of different ways to 
depending on what you need. So for example, having the parentheses optional for function calls. Uh, needs to be pure object oriented. Everything needs to be an object. That actually makes our jobs a lot easier. We don't need to create a bunch of separate data types. We can kind of just create one object data type and then specialize it very slightly to do the things you need for things like integers and numbers. Uh, it needs all the features that we love. Modules, blocks, enumerables, eval, IRB, uh, to have an interactive way to program with it. Uh, it needs to be more dynamic than anyone needs. You need to be able to redefine everything. Again, that's actually not that hard because we're writing all these subroutines in order to uh, define things on objects. And so we can just expose those to the programmers, the thing that you can actually use. Um, and it also needs dynamic memory allocation and a garbage collector. Now, um, this is where I have to tell you uh, about what happened last night when I was trying to get the last bit of this talk ready. Uh, I was having a lot of compiler problems and until about 4 a.m. was trying to debug all the things that were going wrong. So instead of showing you a test suite, which passes an emulator, but for some reason does not pass when I run it on actual hardware, uh, I managed to put together enough of NRuby and uh, reassemble it so that I can give you this demo. Unfortunately, I have to switch floppy disks, so if you hold on one moment. You note the text stays on screen, that's because after that initial floppy disk noises, it's loaded everything into memory. The floppy disk isn't doing anything after this point with the presentation. Pop in the NRuby floppy disk. I'm gonna go ahead and restart the machine to load that floppy disk. I love that clacking sound. All right, I do catalog uh, NRuby, and we're actually running low on time because of that technical difficulty we had initially. Uh, so I'm going to call binary run of nRuby. Oops. Takes a little bit to load. Let me go ahead and get into a prompt. Uh, so uh, I can show you if you can put hello, and it prints hello. <laughs> this may not seem very impressive. I don't know how many of you out there have ever tried to write a parser in a modern programming language. It's, it's not very easy. Uh, writing it in assembly, on the other hand, whole other thing. So just in order to parse this, figure out the objects, and allocate those objects into memory, and then you know use the call stack in order to print it, you would not believe how much machinery is involved in do the, doing this. I'm actually amazed that it runs as fast as it does right now. Uh, we also have flexible syntax. So unlike basic, we can say, puts open parens, call it like a function call. Uh, and it goes ahead and prints that out too. Um, and again, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to pop this out now and go back to the slides to tell you a little bit about how all this is working under the hood. Oops, uh, if you turn it on too fast after turning it off, everything is still in memory and it just errors out in hilarious ways. So have to give another moment. Turn it back on, load it, rerun slides, load the slides up again. This is exciting. <laughs> there we go. Uh, go ahead and skip ahead. There we go. Um, all right. So inside my implementation of NRuby, I uh, had to implement dynamic memory allocation as well as a garbage collector. But because it's Ruby, I want to make sure that you could you know, create as many objects as you wanted. I didn't want to give you those arbitrary limitations of this many of this many objects and this many of this many objects. I wanted all different data types to be stored in one heap like you would in any ordinary Ruby. So you can make as many of those different objects as you want. Um, however, you can make as many as you want as long as you want 256 <laughs> objects max. It's actually less than 256 because you also have objects like false and nil and the class class, which are all create initialization. So technically it's less than that, but I'm pretty sure that none of you here ever need to write a program that uses more than 256 objects. And just ignore the fact that if you actually count the number of objects in Ruby when it initially starts, before it runs any code, it's orders of magnitude larger than this. But you know, it's fine. You're going to have to do an amazing amount with only 256 objects. Uh, so how is it that I write this code? I'm not going in there and actually typing all this on a vintage computer. That is a terrible idea. Instead, modern development on the app two works a little bit differently. Um, sorry. Um, 
you may think that all this is going to be really hard to do, that it's going to be like really difficult to write this program. I would argue that actually getting Apple or Ruby running in the Apple II is not that hard. Um, because writing a language is a really big task, especially trying to write one in assembly. But you can just break it down into smaller tasks. For example, writing a parser in assembly. That is ridiculously difficult. However, if you go ahead and try and write that same, uh, instead of the whole parser, just write a thing that can parse strings, a thing that can parse integers. It actually, each of those tasks is a little bit easier. You build all those up over time, and then eventually you have an entire parser. So the key to this is being patient and breaking everything down into relatively small tasks. However, while it isn't hard, it is super, super tedious. Uh, there's just a lot of grunt work that you have to do in order to do all the assembly programming. Most of that is debugging time. Whenever something goes wrong, you can't just like put in a bunch of print statements and see what all the variables are. Instead, you have to, uh, in the case of modern development, open it up in an emulator, inspect the entire memory map, figure out where it's going long, step by, go step by step through all the assembly. But eventually, you can figure out where your problem lies. Um, now, I've done a lot of like weird programming projects like this, and I've learned over time that there is one secret for doing these like really challenging programming projects or things that you know seem like they might not necessarily work. For example, once I implemented uh, the entire game of chess in a chess AI only using untyped lambda calculus. And in all these projects, the thing that makes it easy is test-driven development. It's the same thing that makes work easy. Now you may say, test-driven development assembly? Is that, is that possible? Uh, Yes, it is. It's just that your tests are basically asserting that uh, you run a subroutine and then look at the value in the A register, and then depending on if it matches something you've hard coded in the test, print out a character to the screen, uh, whether it passes or fails. Then run your test, it prints out a bunch of characters to the screen, and then go through your code and figure out where all those failing characters are, which actual tests does that line up with. It's a little bit tedious, but it makes things a lot easier because it means you're free to kind of rewrite the code as much as you want, and as long as you're preserving all those APIs that your tests are expecting, everything works well. I know this may seem obvious, but when talking to a lot of friends who uh, do similar projects, they were surprised that anyone would actually do test-driven development in assembly. Um, so to actually get this program up and running and do development, you first want to just write all that assembly on your laptop. Use a modern text editor. It's way better. You'll get things like code coloring and autocomplete, it's great. You're then gonna go ahead and assemble the binary, take that uh, raw assembly code and turn it into a machine code binary. However, you can't just load that into an emulator or something like that, you need to actually put it onto a disk or a virtual disk. So the next thing is to run another program that creates a disk image with that binary on it, that puts all the file structure and things around it, and names the file so that the computer can actually recognize that binary and then run it. You then need to go ahead and test that disk in an emulator, and assuming it all works, you then transfer it over via a serial cable, like this USB to RS-232 serial cable I have here. Of course, the Apple IIc doesn't actually have RS-232, because that wasn't super common in computers at the time, so you then need to plug that into this RS-232 to null modem port cable. Um, if any of you actually has these at home, Again, I want to talk to you because you're clearly a very interesting person, but there's someone online who still sells these things, which is very, very useful. Um, you can then go ahead, and once you've transferred all that disk data over, you can use another program to write that out to the floppy disk. I have to use the Apple II to write things onto the floppy disk because I don't know of a five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive that will write Apple II compatible floppy disk and also has a USB port so I can plug it into my computer. Uh, so. The emulator they use is one called Virtual2. Uh, it is great because it has a lot of debugging features. Uh, to get access to a lot of those, you do have to use a paid version, but I want to support this developer because they created a really cool Apple II emulator. Even if you want, we'll simulate the sort of clunking sounds of the disk drive and the green of a phosphorus display. Um, the assembler that I use is the Merlin32 assembler. Merlin32 is interesting because it, even though uh, I believe it was last updated in 2015, it's a descendant of an assembler called Merlin 16, which is a descendant of a long line of Merlin assemblers going all the way back to the original Merlin assembler, which was written on an Apple II for compiling to the Apple II. It's actually descended from an original vintage assembler. Uh, I found that it's the easiest assembler to use and the easiest to get going with is Merlin 32, and it has reasonably good documentation. Um, however, there's also an assembler called CC65, 
Well, Merlin 32 is a little bit more targeted towards the Apple family. CC65 will let you compile onto many different things like the Commodore 64, the Apple II. I think you can also do like NES on there. Uh, however, uh, CC65 is also more difficult to use. So just fair warning. Uh, that's why I chose not to use it. Uh, Apple Commander is a program which lets you from the command line take a 6502 binary and put it into a disk image on your machine and it will generate those disk images for you. It is written in Java, which I find hilarious that my build chain involves Java in order to get things working on the Apple II. But hey, whoever wrote that, thank you. It is a free open source tool and it is absolutely amazing and wonderful to use. Um, uh, then the program that actually transfers that data over the serial line is a program called ADP, uh, sorry, ADT Pro. It has a client on your laptop, and then you plug in a serial cable, you type in a couple assembly commands, it then bootstraps the entire program over into your uh, Apple II, and then from there opens up a nice GUI that you can use to actually take things off of your file system and load them into the Apple II, and then also gives you a function which you can call to write that out to disk. Another really fantastic programming. Uh, has a hilariously kind of out-of-date UI, and I believe it's also written in Java. I don't know why there's so many Java developers doing this stuff, but again, thanks to all of them. Uh, so, uh, assembly is a really difficult programming language to work in, and we're kind of running low on time. Uh, I can tell you, if you haven't yet, play with assembly. It is actually a surprisingly easy programming language to learn. Um, why do I say that? Well, it's because it can only really do one of three things, especially on a CPU like this. Uh, you can do a thing to a register, you know, multiply two registers, or you can think of them like variables together. Um, you can do a thing to a byte in memory, so you can say, take this register and store it here in memory, or take this location in memory and load it into this register. And then you can jump around in your code. You can say, you know, if this particular register is equal to this value, move to this other line of code. It really doesn't do that much, which means it's actually easier to learn assembly than it is almost any other programming language. The difficulty with assembly is figuring out how to translate that relatively small number of things into a working program. The syntax is also easy. It's divided into three columns. The middle one is the only required one. The other two are optional. You have a label, that's just a, a helpful thing that lets you say at this particular line in the machine code, you can use that as a variable to jump back to uh, elsewhere in your code. You have the mnemonic, which is the fancy name for the function that you're calling. It's a translation of the opcode into something that is readable for humans. And then an, uh, uh, optionally, some commands will also take an argument that you pass in. Uh, so here we have uh, a very simple line of assembly code. It just says a CLC, which is short for clear carry. Here's a more complicated one, LDA, load the A register. And then the argument, we have a pound sign, which means a literal value. Whatever number follows is exactly what we transfer in. We're not gonna load from memory. The dollar sign means it's in hexadecimal, and in this case, it's just zero. So we're gonna load the literal value zero in the A register. Uh, the next line, I have a label there, loop. I can use that later to loop back to that line. All that that label does, it says, whatever, uh, whatever bit of code follows next, store the address of that as it is in memory so that then I can use that as a variable later when I want to jump back to that address. Uh, so here I'm comparing with another uh, constant called count, which could have been defined early in the program, and then a branch if not equals loop, and that will, if, the, uh, if that comparison operation ended up with something that wasn't equal, it will go ahead and branch back to the loop. Uh, so, uh, very end here, I want to give you a small idea of what's happening underneath the hood here uh, in NRuby. Uh, and one of the easiest things to understand is the memory management model. So inside of NRuby, as I said, you have 256 objects. Now those 256 uh, objects, they're not really objects, they're like little slots in memory that you can store data into. It is 16 bytes long. So every little chunk of memory that we're going to be managing is 16 bytes long. And we can fit 16 of those onto a 256-bit page. And so what we end up having is this sort of table in memory. We start at page n, and then we have one 16-bit slot followed by another 16-bit slot. And then on page n plus 1, we have more until eventually we have 16 pages, each with 16 slots. And each of those slots has 16 bytes of memory. And thus, we end up with 256 slots available. Um, now, uh, we need to have a unique number for these. One of the reasons why we have 256 slots is it means we can uniquely represent every single object 
with an 8-bit value. So that means that because it's an 8-bit processor, we can very quickly kind of do lookups on objects. Uh, the simplest number scheme, and the one that I started with, is starting on the first page, we're going to go ahead and uh, just have the first slot be called slot 0, and then the next one be called 1, and then 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we just go through all the slots, numbering them sequentially. And now we can uniquely identify each one with a number. Um, uh, so let's say that we want to uh, address the memory in slot CF. Uh, CF uh, would uh, represent that starts on the 240th byte or F0 of the 12th page, 0C. The reason why I see all those 16s is because this means, look there, we want to address the CF slot and that's on the F0 byte and the 0C page. And so we just need to take that C, move it over to the lower nibble, take that F, move it up to the upper nibble, and now we've translated our unique integer representation for that slot into an actual uh, byte and page in memory. Uh, so the assembly for that looks like this. The main thing to look at here is there are all those ASL and LSR instructions. Those are uh, arithmetic shift left and logical shift right. So what we're doing is we're taking that C value, and we're shifting it all the way over to the left, and in that shifting, uh, that zero, it ends up clearing out with zeros as it goes, and so we move that upper nibble to the lower nibble, that gives us our page, and then the next part with all those LSRs, we take that F nibble and we shift it over to the right uh, in order to move it into the F0 slot. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of repeated instructions in here, and this is way slower than I would like it to be. So what if instead of laying out our memory like this, the logical way where each slot is numbered in order, what if we rotate it 90 degrees? So if we were to write sequentially to each slot in memory, we first write to the first slot on page n, and then the first slot on page n plus 1, and then the first slot on page n plus 2, all the way until eventually we run out of pages, and then we loop back and go to the second slot on page n to write our 16th slot. So we've just kind of taken our uh, representation before, rotated and flipped it 90 degrees. When we do that, you'll notice that now the byte that we're writing to, that C, is in the same position as it is in our integer representation. And in the page, you'll notice the F there that uh, gives us the page that uh, that particular CF address goes to is actually in the same position. The nibbles are in the exact same place. So instead of having to shift that C over and shift that F over to translate our address, instead, what we can do is just do an AND operation. Just kind of wipe out with zeros the C on one side, that gives us one value, and then wipe out the F on the other side, that gives us the other value. Uh, so again, here's our program before, and here's our program afterwards. Assembly programming is doing a lot of little things like this. You write an algorithm, you get it to work, and then you figure out if you play around with the numbers if there's a smaller and faster way to write your program. Uh, so what's next for NRuby? Uh, I'd like to finish up version 1.0, obviously, and I'm working very actively on that. The reason why NRuby isn't on GitHub right now is because there are a couple of little libraries in there that uh, it's using currently for its de uh, while I'm developing it that are actually not open source, and so legally I don't want to get in trouble for releasing non-open source software. However, in version 1.1 or 1.0, I'm going to strip all that out so that I can put up on GitHub. If you want, you can follow me on Twitter. I'll announce it when it finally comes out. Uh, once I do have it working, I am curious to try getting NRuby working on other processors. I'm especially interested in the MSP430, which is a really cool microprocessor that's a more modern one, especially because you get super low power variants. So, for example, you can have a microprocessor that runs on a lemon with a copper plate and a zinc plate put in it like you used to in science class. I would love the idea of Ruby, this like heavyweight, inefficient programming language, running on the power of a lemon. I think that would be fantastic. And also the MSP430 is more powerful, so it's a little bit easier to write code for. I also want to try getting it working on other computers that use the 6502, especially the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System. Wouldn't it be cool to write a game that runs in Ruby, and that Ruby is actually running on the Nintendo Entertainment System? The thing that's going to make this very challenging, uh, and the reason why I'm interested in it, is the NES only had two kilobytes of RAM, so that's where all your data would go, and then your source code would be in 40 kilobytes of ROM. So you have a lot of ROM space, but you don't have that much space to actually store the objects. So it'll be relatively interesting, at least for me, to do that. So thank you so much for all of your time. If you have any questions, feel free to see me afterwards. Thank you.